Thank you for the welcoming words uh, and thank you for having me at the conference. Um, it's a really pleasure to be able to deliver a keynote and I'm also in a very luxurious position speaking on the, sec on the third day of the conference because there's, as Nick has mentioned, there has been a lot of interesting conversations about these different topics that I will touch upon to some extent. So I'm really kind of grateful for that. So we kind of can go deeper into those themes. Uh, so my name is Jan Schwelk, as Nick mentioned, and I'm based at the Charles University in Prague and uh, I'm a member of the Prague Game Production Studies Research Group. And I will be talking about the connections between game monetization and player surveillance. So before I kind of provide a little bit more context for, for my talk, uh, I want to just kind of uh, tease out the main question that I will be trying to answer during, the, during my talk. So what I've been trying to kind of investigate and problematize is the connection between player surveillance and video game monetization. And by surveillance, I mean specifically the sort of big data approaches to uh, player surveillance, so game telemetries, quantitative approaches to observing and tracking what's happening in video games. So kind of to show like a simplified model that we can use to kind of start addressing these connections, sort of the, perhaps the basic connection between surveillance and monetization is that Surveillance provides data for monetization. I mean specifically for optimization of monetization. So by observing what players do in games, uh, video game developers can kind of uh, improve the profitability of monetization options in the video games, in video games. And sort of in return, by kind of making the game profitable, uh, video game developers and sort of the monetization practices justify the cost of running surveillance. So surveillance, as I will kind of show later in the talk, uh, might be fairly, fairly easy to implement nowadays thanks to digital platforms and various game engines that already include some of the kind of functionality related to tracking uh, in-game behavior. But again, kind of analyzing what's happening and making sort of uh, actionable uh, findings about what players are doing in the game is something that requires a lot of resources, big departments, a lot of data analysts, something that Afra has already talked about yesterday, that data analysts are becoming very important for the video game industry and they are becoming one of the central roles of how especially games as service, another term that we've heard about uh, yesterday, sort of kind of implements uh, data analysts and data analytics into the production pipeline. So another question that I will try to answer to some extend at least, or try to answer, is whether players can resist being tracked and monetized. And how within these sort of infrastructures of control, sort of these network uh, systems that players operate in, especially in these always online games, whether there's even possibility to resist what developers are imposing on players. So uh, this research tries to kind of bring together some of my previous projects that I've worked on, sort of going in a reverse order as they were published. Uh, the most recent one uh, was on infographics and player surveillance, and I was trying to understand what role infographics play in sort of the normalization of player surveillance, and also kind of understanding how surveillance is very much uh, connected to monetization, kind of observing kind of this spending behavior in video games. So the other uh, article and chapter that I'm drawing from here is the research that we've done with Elise van Russo, and I'm really happy that she collaborated with me on that project, looking at the production context of video game monetization. So I was, we were specifically interested in who are the people kind of that are expected to work on monetization, and we looked at job advertisements, as well as we also conducted interviews with a monetization specialists in the video game industry, and kind of realized that it is very much sort of the data analytic aspect of video, video game production. And sort of the last part that tries to kind of uh, answer the resistance angle that I was also teasing out in the previous slide is my uh, piece on resistance towards video game updates. So whether uh, 
players have any chance of resisting changes that are made to their games. And that uh, spe applies specifically to games as service, which are always evolving, and uh, these updates often kind of change the terms at which players are playing, and whether there's any possibility for players to kind of uh, disagree and make a point about not uh, kind of being happy with what has been done to the game that were, they were used to be playing. So these are sort of the three pieces of research that I will try to bridge together. In, in this talk today. So I, th I got interested in you know, infographics and, and surveillance. Uh, I think around the time when I was playing Mass Effect 3 in 2012, a fairly kind of contentious part of the uh, original trilogy, thanks to its uh, kind of uh, controversial ending when it was released. But what I, I guess, find more interesting and relevant for my talk today is the statistics that uh, that uh, Bioware, the developer of the game, released in, uh, on a, in a panel at PAX in 2013, in the Mass, Res Mass Effect retrospective panel. And these statistics kind of show fairly surprising numbers of, and how players kind of skip a lot of the content that has been made into the game. So I'm not sure if it's that well visible, but what the infographic, and I mean, uh, it's the infographic on the right, um, kind of shows is that some squad members are very, like, are not as popular as others. Some decisions are uh, not as kind of common. And even though, for example, the female version of Shepard was sort of a big part of the fan culture around the game, very few people or relatively few people kind of played as the character. So we might be thinking, why would the developer put so many resources into creating content that very few people are ex actually experiencing. And for RPGs, you know, pr providing the possibility of choice is very important, so maybe this sort of very kind of optimi optimization-driven uh, approach wouldn't make much sense anyway, but it's an interesting example, especially if we look at sort of the discussion about data-driven design and how data can kind of help us and help developers to kind of optimize what they're kind of working on and what features they're improving and so on. And Mass Effect also included a multiplayer mo uh, mode, which uh, had a more kind of uh, regular implementation of, of uh, player surveillance, kind of seeing what's happening in the game, seeing if there are you know, some uh, unfair practices, some cheating going on, and kind of being then able to act upon that. So this is where I first started to get interested in, in uh, player surveillance and sort of its connection to monetization as well. And in 2018, I also ended up working for a video game company as a data analyst. So I have a little bit of background from the industry Although, of course, I cannot share any details of what I was working on, uh, it still was a really, I think, uh, useful experience to be later able to talk about uh, data analytics and player surveillance in more detail. So, uh, I want to start with the theme of surveillance and how it has evolved over time and how sort of the different technological possibilities have changed how surveillance is thought of and implemented in video games. So this is a fairly kind of ridiculous example of what we might maybe understand as surveillance. It's perhaps more of a spectatorship of games. And of course, uh, spectatorship and the idea of observing what others are doing in the game uh, go back to the early days, especially during the arcade uh, golden age. Uh, it was fairly common to observe what others are doing in the game. So kind of seeing how they are doing. So this idea of spectatorship was pretty uh, kind of, you know, uh, there from the start for uh, video game culture. Uh, high scores then kind of presented this first, I guess, organized effort of collecting kind of more kind of... Uh, uh, a collective f coordinated effort of collecting data from the games. Of course, these were self-reported, so they relied on sort of uh, participation, voluntary participation of players that were sub submitting these high scores. And you know, video game magazines back in the day, and you know, uh, organizations like the Twin Galaxies were collecting high scores, creating leaderboards, so giving the developers also some idea of how players are doing in their games. And you know, if we kind of go back to the distinction of games as products and games as services, uh, we know that 
and this has been already talked about a little bit uh, yesterday, that for games as products, it might not be as important to really uh, know what players are doing in the game after it has been sold. You know, like the developer gets you know, their one-time fee, and then they might hope that uh, they, the players will buy the next installment. And it's not maybe as effective or time efficient or resource efficient to kind of spend a lot of effort seeing what players are doing in the game. So it's sort of the historical moment that we kind of see in the 1970s, 1980s. So the situation starts changing in the 1990s and 2000s with the emergence of online multiplayer games and how sort of the network connectivity of games sort of changes the relationships between developers and establishes this more long-term relationship between the two parties. And with the first popular uh, online multiplayer games, like you know, World of Warcraft, uh, this kind of the relationship and the idea behind player surveillance often kind of related to anti-cheating measures. And this is something that also Stefano De Paoli and Afrakur talked about in their 2010 article about cheating in, uh, in MMORPGs. So here the idea of player surveillance kind of relates to the, uh, to the fact that it is sometimes important to govern in-game activity, to prevent people from ruining other people's fun, right? Like if other people are cheating, then it ruins the experience of other players. So the idea that player surveillance can be sort of beneficial for other players, so they're kind of uh, uh, guarded by the developers who can kind of root out the bad behavior in the game if they know what's happening in the game. But, uh, of course, these uh, different technological implementations of player surveillance, like the Warden anti-cheating measure for World of Warcraft, were also seen at that time as sort of a spyware equivalent. They were not only s tracking what's happening in the game, but sometimes also observing what's happening in the RAM of the computer that was running the game. So they were kind of really uh, stepping on the privacy of the player if they wanted to play. But there were very few uh, as I will also show later, there are very few ways of kind of resisting this oversight, this sort of surveillance, if we want to keep playing these games, especially if it's this sort of server-client structure where the server is collecting a lot of data from the client machines. So the situation sort of develops further uh, in the 2010s, of course, with the uh, advent of games as service, freemium monetization, you know, App Store opening up in-app purchases in 20, 2009, Google Play Store in 2011. So this kind of opens up new opportunities for data analytics and player surveillance. And this is an example from Ghost uh, Recon Wildlands, a game by Ubisoft, and uh, an academic article that, they, uh, that the people working on the game have published. And it kind of shows different, different uses for data and including sort of these data-driven approaches where data is used to kind of govern different aspects of, the, of, of games. And uh, the kind of the current moment that we're, that we're in, there's uh, more and more research kind of discussing the importance of data analytics for video games. And here I'm borrowing a quote from my former colleagues, Oli Sotama, Heike Tine, and Taina Milhanen. And they talk to Finnish uh, game professionals working with data and kind of point out sort of this ubiquity uh, of data-driven design. And to kind of to hear, to read out the quote, definitely it is possible with pure luck to make a good game without data, but it's like winning the lottery. In reality, every decision down to how individual pixels are placed on the screen is data-driven these days. And the larger the company, the stricter they are in thinking and testing that stuff. So, of course, this is one of the many opinions that we can take on, on the current situation in video game production, but I guess it sort of already kind of shows maybe the prevalence and sort of the trend of data-driven design, especially for games where it really matters, like the games as service games and titles. So, uh, here I kind of want to kind of take a little step back and make a distinction between surveillance and data analytics. And I've been kind of, kind of combining the two, talking about both, but it's important kind of to realize that these are two different kind of 
parts of the process of making games, of, of the video game production pipeline. So surveillance provides data for data analytics, but uh, sort of data analytics is another step of working with the data. And why, th the reason why I think it's, it's, it's important to distinguish between the two is that sort of the uh, research that has been done on these things kind of suggests that surveillance is nowadays fairly easy to implement in video games. And that's thanks to digital platforms which already provide some tracking capabilities to video game developers. So even achievement and trophy systems on you know, different platforms give some basic idea of what players are doing in the game. Unity uh, includes you know, uh, surveillance options. Unity has also bought Delta DNA, a data analytics company, so it already kind of provides these basic uh, kind of ready-made tools that can be implemented into games. So, relatively speaking, we could argue that uh, surveillance is fairly easy to implement into video games. On the other hand, data analytics is, can be a very costly operation. If, you know, it's, it's fairly easy to generate a lot of data from the player behavior and what kind of just kind of setting up the video game telemetry and, you know, starting to collect the data, but then kind of making, you know, uh, any kind of meaningful Analysis based on the data can be more demanding. And this is something that Jennifer Whitson has talked about in her article, The New Spirit of Capitalism in the Game Industry. And here she kind of did an ethnographic research in a small uh, indie studio that was kind of trying to uh, use and implement surveillance and data analytics. And sort of her conclusion here is that although, you know, freemium and games service has been talked about as this area where the barriers of entry are relatively easy, the production, uh, the, 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 the length of production is fairly small compared to AAA games, and also the costs of production are not as high. It, there are still sort of uh, big differences in what major companies like King, you know, Tencent or Wargaming can do with all the data that they're collecting from their players compared to smaller uh, studios that kind of are just trying to uh, enter the market. So although, you know, it might seem, or I can, I'm kind of painting a picture that data-driven design is really important, uh, I also want to kind of show that there are different ways of working with data, even if we kind of decide to collect a lot of uh, information about gameplay behavior. And so kind of to use a recent example, it also kind of, I guess, mirrors some of the things that I've already talked about, uh, about Mass Effect 3. Uh, Baldur's Gate 3 also collects a lot of kind of detailed data about what players are doing in the game. So it's a choice-driven game, so also it's, I guess, interesting for the developers to uh, see how, how, how people are going through the game, what sort of experience they're having, what, what decisions they're taking. So, you know, quick, uh, soon after the release, uh, Larian Studios uh, published this infographic. And this is just a small portion of it. It, you know, goes more into detail about different aspects of the game. So, we see that uh, or also this game implements player surveillance. It tracks what players are doing in the game. But uh, at the same time, Sven Winke, the head of, the, head of Larian Studios, went on record for the official Dungeons and Dragons YouTube channel, claiming that they're not really trying to use data for creative decisions. To read his quote, I try not to look at data because otherwise it will influence the creative decisions. And I want to make sure that we keep on investing heavily in things that maybe 0.001% of the audience will see, because it is important that any journey that you take in your game will be equally rewarding. And he continues. If you would say, oh, 80% of players go there and they see that, what's going to happen is that you're going to put all your effort into the 80% experience and you're not going to do anything or less on the 20%. That's not what you should do when you make a game like this. We don't let it guide the game development. So here's sort of an alternative approach to kind of working with data. It's, I guess it still might be worth to kind of look at data and maybe consider why some people are maybe not playing as specific classes and if there's something wrong, but for sort of these more design-related decisions in game production, Larian Studios is trying kind of to draw a line between how data is used. And that kind of goes against a lot of the research that we have about games as service and how data is really kind of driving the design. And also the quote that I've used from research by Ole Sotama, Heikutuni, and Taina Myohanen.
Okay, so this brings me to the second theme of monetization and how it kind of connects to player surveillance. And we've already heard a lot about sort of games as products and how they differ from games as services, uh, how they kind of establish a different relationship. So games as services, uh, we already heard a little bit about it, but what I want to kind of reiterate is that they establish sort of a long-term relationship between players and developers. And this is then sort of monetized through different types of microtransactions, subscriptions, and so on. And this more kind of continuous relationship also kind of makes it, makes it more kind of relevant for developers to observe what players are doing in the game. It's not this one-time kind of uh, transaction that happens with premium games or, you know, used to happen nowadays a lot of premium games also include some sort of uh, additional monetization. But it is ongoing relationship where it is important to see you know, whether players are spending time on this part of the game and whether we should maybe or the developers should sort of put their resources in kind of in that part of the game. So I think it's fairly safe to you know, argue that games as service sector is a key domain of data-driven design. And that's lar in large part due to monetization. And sort of a on a related note and kind of looking at this from a slightly different perspective, this also seems to be confirmed by the research that we were doing with Lis van Russo. As I mentioned, we looked at job advertisements for monetization-related positions. And we found out that uh, you know, in these job descriptions, uh, developers dealing with monetizations are expected to have data analytics skills in you know, two-thirds of the cases and a sort of a more vaguely kind of defined uh, expectation of an analytical mindset in 78%. And the 100 uh, job advertisements that we have analyzed, it's not uh, entirely representative, but I think it still kind of shows a fairly clear picture that there's definitely connection between monetization and data analytics. And this is sort of something that I was trying to kind of get to, you know, uh, in, in, in the talk until now. So while we know that monetization and data analytics seems to be very closely connected, it is also, uh, we also know from game culture and uh, from sort of reactions of players that monetization can be quite controversial. And we've already talked about dark patterns in the previous talks and how kind of people kind of rebel against them. And of course, when we kind of start learning about what uh, tricks developers might be playing on players, there's of course reason to be concerned about sort of the ways monetization is implemented in some, in some games. And these are just two examples. I think most of you probably heard about Star Wars Battlefront 2, a game that was supposed to have loot boxes, but due to a big uh, fan backlash before the actual release of the game, uh, the, uh, the loot boxes were removed from the game and from the progression system uh, of the character, or paid loot boxes to be more precise, or Wolfenstein Youngblood, a Wolfenstein uh, spin-off game that also included microtransactions. So it is pretty clear that monetization via microtransactions, microtransactions, loot boxes, but other uh, uh, strategies is controversial. And there's been a lot of interesting research written on that, uh, and also you know, the specialized press covers a lot of these controversies. So you know, taking that into account, I think uh, it's sort of, it makes sense for game developers then to try to reframe these questions. And we've already heard sort of that uh, many video game companies are moving away from loot boxes because they, are f they seem they are you know, too, much, you know, uh, too much of a problem. People kind of are complaining about it. They are being outlawed in different countries. They're moving to battle passes and other things that also have some dark part patterns. So, but the industry seems to be adjusting to what sort of players are thinking and what regulators are doing. So they're kind of reacting. They're reflexive and sort of very much aware of this critique that also academics are lodging against the industry. So then it, of course, makes sense for the video game industry to try to come up with, you know, 
ways of reframing the discussion. And maybe some of you remember when EA representatives were trying to portray loot boxes as surprise mechanics, kind of downplaying the kind of the exploitative gambling-like aspects that loot boxes have. And of course, surprise mechanics, we can also understand, I guess, loot boxes like that, but the important part of monetization through loot boxes is something that seems to be just sort of downplayed when you know, uh, developers kind of resort to these different terms to address uh, monetization options within games. And I guess my favorite example in sort of how re reflexive the industry can be about sort of the perceived issues uh, that you know, other stakeholders have regarding video games and video game monetization is Apex Legends, a battle royale game from 2019 that had a very interesting sort of release strategy. So the game was announced just a few days prior to its release, uh, was announced a few days prior to its release to kind of limit the amount of negative, you know, online discussions that could happen before players could play the game. And this is something that Drew McCoy, representative of Respawn Entertainment, the studio behind the game, uh, told in an interview for Eurogamer. To read the quote, we're doing a free-to-play game with essentially loot boxes after we were bought by EA and that it's not Titanfall 3. It's the perfect recipe for a marketing plan to go awry, so why have that? Let's just ship the game and let players play. So to kind of prevent this speculation about you know, how uh, the game uses monetization and loot boxes, uh, Respawn kind of decided with EA decided to release the game, kind of have a big promotion, you know, paying Ninja to stream the game on Twitch, sort of attract a lot of players to the game who might not have time sort of to consider sort of the problematic monetization, monetization options within the game. And the game became a success. So this strategy kind of seems to be seem, seems to have paid out in that specific case. So if we go sort of to the basic model that I tr showed in, in the beginning about how surveillance feeds data for monetization and monetization kind of justifies the, the cost of running surveillance because it generates more money for video game companies. There are different ways how uh, video game companies might try to kind of obscure this connection, kind of make it harder for players and you know, other stakeholders to realize this sort of really complicated uh, dynamic that extracts value from players. And this kind of brings me to one of the other articles that i combining in this talk, uh, my research on video game infographics. And why do I think that video game infographics sort of obscure this relation bet relationship between surveillance and monetization? It's because they very rarely talk about monetization. And and what I've tried to establish until this point, up to this point, is that monetization and surveillance are deeply interconnected and that uh, oftentimes, you know, the main reason to even start collecting data is to know better how people are spending their money in games. So it seems quite kind of telling that video game infographics mostly avoid any kind of monetization related statistics within them. So for this research I looked at 200 infographics and I think two to three of them had something about the number of paid subscribers to sort of a premium version of an MMO. All the other games talk about these very harmless kind of trivia fun facts about the game. And so I would say this is one of the ways how the video game industry and different video game companies uh, kind of try to obscure the connection between surveillance and monetization and kind of try to normalize player surveillance as something that's sort of mutually beneficial. You know, that players can get some interesting facts about what's going in in the game, they can compare how their play style kind of, uh, you know, ranks up to what other players are doing in the game, but we also, do, the companies also don't show uh, uh, the players that, you know, one of the main reasons why we collect this data is to improve monetization in the game. So, to just a f to give you a few examples of sort of the very common metrics in infographics, this can be numbers of players, often used to kind of boast about the success of the game. It's also very hard sometimes to kind of really compare these numbers. You know, there might be different methodologies used, you know, whether there are player accounts, unique players, you know, it's hard to kind of tell what sort of methodology these companies are using to count players. The same goes to time spent in the games. And then we even get to like these really, you know, 
I guess, irrelevant stats, wearing these fun facts and trivia about kills, a very, you know, favor a very popular metric that's often mentioned in, in infographics, or, you know, different kind of popularity of features within the game. So a lot of these very uh, seemingly harmless data about what players are doing in the game. But, of course, we should be aware that uh, one of the main reasons that, uh, that surveillance is, you know, implemented is to see what, uh, how to optimize games, how to optimize game development and or monetization if it is in, included in these games. So I guess the, the point that I was trying to make is to, that infographics try to downplay this connection, normalize player surveillance, kind of uh, try to po position it as something mutually beneficial for both players and developers. But of course, this dynamic isn't really kind of uh, equal or even for the two parties involved. The developers have all the information, but uh, players rarely know what, what sort of information is even collected about their you know, in-game behavior. And that brings me to the last section uh, of my keynote about uh, resistance and whether there is possibility for resistance within these sort of uh, infrastructures of surveillance and monetization. And here I want to also make a distinction between, you know, sort of legitimate, legitimate resistance, you know, against dark patterns, uh, against exploitation of players, and uh, toxic kind of player reactions to different things that are happening in the game. So we've also, we're probably all aware that, you know, player communities can, have, can be very toxic toward developers, and that's sort of not the thing that I'm trying to talk about today. I'm more kind of interested in how sort of these uneven dynamics and this kind of logics of exploitation uh, are kind of forced upon players and whether there is sort of legitimate way of resisting against this kind of value extraction from players. And sort of the context that I'm using here is uh, all the research and theorization that has been done on surveillance capitalism or data colonialism. It already talks about how, you know, by... Uh, uh, collecting data about what users, players, and this applies to very, you know, various contexts, not just video games, how tech companies are kind of generating value from their users by collecting user data, you know, selling it to advertisers. And that's perhaps not as kind of common in video games, but data can be used to optimize monetization. And there are also examples of games selling player data to third parties. I think Pokemon Go uses, you know, player data to sell advertising, you know, sp special, sp you can advertise within the game, and so on. So, uh, this kind of provides the background for uh, this part of talk about resistance, and also what I think it's maybe also important to mention is that the ways uh, how video games are governed, uh, they kind of use this sort of protocological power. And this is a concept used by Alexander Galloway, which talks about sort of this soft power that is distributed through these kind of network systems. So protocological power refers to the fact that if players want to be part of the game, they want to keep playing, they want to be kind of connected to these games or services, they have to always accept the latest terms of service, you know, the updates, uh, and they have very little uh, po uh, possibility to kind of do anything about it. If they want to keep playing, they have to download the update, otherwise they get disconnected. So this is something that I've looked in my article, and I've uh, focused on three games, Borderlands 2, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, Marvel Strike Force, but there's also other research, such as the one by David Murphy, about Call of Duty Black Ops 2. And it all kind of points to the fact that resistance seems to be very difficult within protocol structures. So in all these cases, players were fairly uh, sort of ineffective at kind of resisting what has been, what is being pushed on them uh, within the game itself. So for Borderlands 2, it is not a perfect protocol. In, in a way that you can play it offline, it's a cooperative game, so you can kind of decide not to use the updated version and play without any other players in the game. Counter-Strike, that case, kind of, uh, the protest bec became successful because esports organizers have stepped in, so also kind of created their own roles on top of what the game was trying to kind of influence players to do. There was a this specific case refers to a you know, new gun being introduced that people started uh, complaining about for it being too overpowered. 
and the esports organizers kind of outlawed the gun for the for their tournaments and kind of forced Valve to make a decision and kind of roll back the uh, the weapon and kind of nerf it in a later update. And with Marvel Strike Force, uh, content creators kind of start boycotting the game and kind of tr again kind of taking the protest out of the protocol structure of the network kind of infrastructure infrastructure of the game. And a very similar case happened with Call of Duty Black Ops 2, uh, where also then in that case, you know, the toxic reaction toward the update also sort of uh, kind of undermined the legitimacy of the concerns that some players had about what is being done with the game. So because people were, you know, sending death threats to developers that already kind of uh, weakened their case against what's happening in the game. And I think the Diablo 4, uh, uh, example that happened uh, in, in you know this summer also kind of seems to confirm that it is very hard to uh, resist what's happening in the games within the games themselves, but that players often have to step outside. And in this case, you know, review bombing initiatives kind of made it clear for Blizzard that they have kind of probably done something wrong, and they've admitted that the patch that they released was too kind of harsh towards you know player power within the game and that they will be rolling back a lot of these changes you know in the upcoming updates so this all kind of seems to kind of suggest that there's very little space for resistance within protocol and within sort of this uh, environment of surveillance and monetization but i also want to kind of show a one maybe hopeful example of how this sort of data driven uh, approach to in game in, uh, to video game development can be used to send a message. So if we kind of go back through sort of this model that I've shown and the idea to uh, obscure the connection between surveillance and monetization, uh, I think this, uh, the question that I kind of will try to answer in the remaining minutes is, is there a possibility for player resistance within this sort of setup of players being surveilled and monetized? And the example that I will be using is slightly specific. It's not, you know, video game per se, but it's very much connected to these to this idea of games as service, and it's about Dungeons and Dragons. So, in January uh, in this year, uh, the Wizards of the Coast, the publisher of the game, was trying to kind of change the license of the game, so which would affect a lot of third-party creators, but also players. So the possibility to release you know, supplemental materials for Dungeons and Dragons. So the fifth edition rules for Dungeons and Dragons kind of allow anyone to publish something like a you know adventure for the game, a new source book, new setting. And that's very that's kind of uh, uh, made legal through the existing license. But in January, Wizards of the Coast were trying to change the, the rules of the game, change to, uh, metaphorically speaking, and introduce a more kind of uh, prohibitive licensing structure where uh, third party creators would have to pay licensing fees for their products. And that would you know, change the whole landscape and also the amount of content that would be released for Dungeons and Dragons if people would have to start paying for uh, creating these you know, third party products. So you know, this caused a lot of uh, negative reception among fans and also third party creators and thanks to also leakers from Wizards of the Coast which who probably were also unhappy with these changes that the leadership was doing at the company uh, the community kind of learned about the fact that uh, Wizards of the Coast seem to be paying attention to D&D Beyond subscriptions so D&D Beyond is a digital tool for Dungeons and Dragons and as a subscription model if you pay for it you get the access to some uh, you know, specific features, different types of, you know, bigger number of characters and so on. So it's used to kind of improve, enhance the experience of playing D&D, kind of organizing, you know, a lot of sort of DM related stuff as well. So uh, players kind of figure out that Wizards of the Coast seem to be paying attention to subscription numbers and started kind of organizing and canceling their subscriptions to kind of send the message to uh, Wizards of the Coast, kind of using this idea of you know, uh, surveillance and monetization and how these two things are connected, this loop uh, that 
uh, nowadays companies seem to be paying a lot of attention to sort of really being able to quantify the size of their resistance to this new license. And they eventually succeeded, and you know, a few weeks later, Wizards of the Coast walked back the decision and even improved some of the legal protection for third-party creators by moving the standard uh, reference document uh, to uh, a Creative Commons license, which is irrevocable, and there was some of the discussion go before about whether the rules could be changed. Now it's sort of uh, very much protected uh, infinitely. So in a later earnings call, uh, the representatives of Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro, its parent company, kind of spoke about D&D Beyond subscriptions and kind of downplayed the importance, but still kind of, I think the fact that they even kind of mentioned these things when talking to the investors kind of shows that there was a concern that this could be an issue and that this was something that, was, that they were trying to kind of repair and that sort of the decision to walk back this licensing change kind of uh, shows that they actually care about subscriptions to the and Beyond as this very stable income for the company. So to go back to the to the model, uh, I think sort of this in interest in data-driven kind of uh, development uh, allows players to kind of intersect and hijack this model by kind of providing quantifiable resistance. So uh, uh, giving them sort of this input within that system if we understand how uh, video game developers are kind of uh, governing them ga game, their game and what sort of metrics they are interested in uh, observing. So thanks to the leaker, uh, the community around Dungeons and Dragons knew that D&D subscriptions are a valuable metric that they can then kind of organize uh, around and boycott. So I want to end on two uh, kind of takeaways. First, that already is sort of uh, uh, evident from the talks that we had you know, in the previous days, that games as service paradigm combines surveillance and continuous monetization to extract value from players. And I think this is a very problematic dynamic that it definitely requires sort of our attention and awareness among players. And sort of even not having the knowledge of what sort of data is being collected is definitely problematic in this respect. But I think on a more hopeful note, I think the industry emphasis, emphasis on quantifiable metrics can be used by players to stage protests against games, kind of using the logics of how game industry now operates. You know, it is maybe sometimes now easier to kind of show how big these uh, fan initiatives and player initiatives are. Previously, it might be hard to kind of quantify if people are complaining on Reddit, on, on different you know, uh, online spaces, but by kind of using this uh, surveillance apparatus, maybe it is sometimes easier to send the message to developers and kind of that, they, that players disagree with something that is being done through their game. So yeah, thank you for your attention. <laughs>